Hi everyone, welcome to Belmont Journal. I'm Anne Marie Mahoney, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing John Phelan, our superintendent of schools. Sadly, John has decided to retire, so this is a great opportunity for us to sort of review what he's been doing here for us in Belmont and talk in general about what are the trends and what are the challenges in education that he's been confronting along with the rest of the staff of the Belmont Public Schools. I think this will be a fascinating conversation. John, welcome. Great to see you. Happy we could fit this in before you leave. Thank you for having me, Emory. Um, let's start off. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to come to Belmont back in 2015, 14? 2014. 14, okay. So uh, I was very fortunate to be able to be in public education in the city of Boston for almost 10 years and then the town of Milton for about 16 or 18 years and made my way from teacher to administrator to principal and assistant superintendent. And uh, at that time, I really felt uh, of 16 years in one district uh, in Milton, it would be great to kind of look beyond those borders into a different role. I uh, have always admired Belmont uh, from afar because it actually matched up with Milton a little bit. We are right on the other side of the city. You guys are on this side of the city. We have a big private school. Uh, Belmont has Belmont Hill, uh, same size, town size, et cetera. But the thing that I always noticed the most was that we had competing art students in the Boston Scholastic yes. Art yes. Uh, list every year yes. in the Boston Globe. So I would always say, look at those students doing so well in, in art and I'd go to the music festivals that they have across the state and see Belmont there all the time. So it was actually the performing arts that caught my attention that anytime a community can value performing arts, you know it's a great community to be in. So uh, in 2014, I applied and was fortunately chosen. And uh, in the last nine years, I've gone by very, very fast uh, from my point of view. So I was glad to be here for nine years and, uh, and I think good things are coming for Belmont. Thank you, excellent. And you're right, Belmont is really a star in the, in the fine and performing arts. I know my children benefited greatly from all of it, so mm -hmm. I'm glad that's what drew you here. Mm -hmm. And yes, nine years, I can't believe when I was putting my notes together, I'm saying, wow, he's been here a while. That's really great in this mm -hmm. day and age yeah. of superintendents moving quite a bit. Uh, let's start out with what, what would you perceive to be the highlights of those nine years here, or maybe what accomplishments are you most proud of? So it's, it's amazing that you get to be the person that I get to talk to you about this <laughs> because I met you back when we needed space for the schools. Absolutely, our yes. Our enrollment was going uh, through the roof, over 130 students net new per year. We didn't have the staffing to support that, nor did we have the space. So I remember you were uh, very, very uh, open to volunteering to be part of the short-term space yeah. group that had yeah. met with Ellen Schreiber and a couple of other folks that generated modular classrooms at every level of the district as a short-term right. plan. And ultimately that was the foundation for the Belmont Middle High School Building Committee uh, to put in an application and try to find a long-term solution to what was then a very, very stark enrollment picture uh, in lack of space. So I think one of the accomplishments of my work here is just kind of recognizing what the big problem was right away, which was budget, staffing, and space and trying to make a plan to address each one of those. And we were able to start the process of the short-term plan with the modulars with your help and the capital committee's help. Yep. Um, and then we were able to revamp the, the application for the long-term plan for the school, which was, uh, you know, we are in year seven of that process right now. We're still uh, involved. So seven of my nine years will be the building project. And, and aside from that, I, I was amazed at the amount of work you and your capital uh, committee uh, volunteers have done around the police station, the DPW. Uh, I mean, when we first met, we had a lot of building projects that we, we sure had to did. get done as a town, and it was library, schools, rank, DPW, police station. And now let, look where we are nine years it, later, it, and we're in your big are. part of the success. We, we have a brand new school that we're opening in September. We have um, the, the DPW yard was done with your expertise. Quickly. The police station was done with yeah. your expertise. The library's getting ready, the rink's getting ready. It's all starting to flow together. And we, you know, we used to say back then, we're gonna wake up in 10 or 12 years and we're gonna have all these assets ready for long-term use for the town. Right. And we're almost there, and it's a great story. Yeah, yeah, it's a really great no, story. No, you're right, and, and I'm happy you've highlighted that because it is, I mean, sometimes people do get lost in the weeds of, mm -hmm. oh, you're asking us for more money, why can't you take care of these buildings, et cetera, et cetera. But 
it's been a push, but here we are, we're almost there. We are, and we have some nice uh, environmental pieces with the solar panels on the roof of the high school. Right. We're looking at everything differently and how we, uh, we're getting ready to do uh, buses that will uh, be uh, electronic as opposed to gasoline. I in saw a couple that of town meeting, yep. So it's, I, the, in the weeds is where the work happens, but you always have to remember to keep your head up above the, uh, of the cloud of that kind of uh, worry and, and, and work each day. And you always had that big picture. You always said, these are the big pieces that we have to do as a town and we'll do them one at a time, and we might go out of order once in a while because the schools jumped in real quick because we got the grant. They jumped really ahead of what we had tentatively been planning, Correct. yes. But yes. but then everything got its own space back, and they got back on pace, and, and now they'll all be done. So yeah. I'm really thankful. I, I say it, it to the town meeting last year. We're called the town of homes in Belmont, but I think we're the town of volunteers. I think the volunteer committee work in this town is extraordinary. People like yourself, Pat Bruch, Mark Haley now, Kathy oh, yeah. Cohane. Oh, yeah. I mean, these people are working, school committees, board of uh, select board folks, they're working a lot of hours to make sure that uh, the town is getting what they need. So the, the, their help and support and leadership is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you're you welcome. for that. Oh, you're Thank welcome. Thank you. Um, and I think all of these volunteers, particularly some people like Mark Haley and others that you've named, bring an enormous amount of professional expertise as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. And that's just given gratis, Bill Lavallo, yeah. all those other people on these building mm -hmm. committees. They give and give and give, and yeah. it, it's really... And they're your neighbors, right? So when we get a little yes. frustrated with something that might not be moving as fast or not sure how the accountability for that worked, these this is the mechanism in place for your neighbors to be able to show you that they're watching the tax dollar just like you want them to, right. that they're spending it appropriately, that they're making the best decisions they can. And ironically, uh, our new superintendent is from Belmont. Uh, yes. She'll be starting July 1st. Our interim assistant superintendent is a Belmont resident. Oh, all right. And awesome. this didn't happen uh, by any strategy. And the new director of technology is a Belmont resident. So Perfect. I think that it's a unique turn now that we have some folks. I think when you volunteer and you live here, it means more. And I think that for the three new administrators coming into the district, they're going to have a lot of equity in making sure that this goes well. Uh, for the town and a well. lot of accountability. Yeah. You know, and that's both a gift and a challenge. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So I worked in Milton and lived in Milton for 16 years. That's and hard. I, I learned to get my coffee in Dorchester, so <laughs> that, that, that's how it all worked. That's why I like going <laughs> away in the summer. I can go grocery shopping and nobody knows that's me. That's right. <laughs> all right. Um, back, back to our schools. Um, both you as the superintendent and as we read the newspapers and we listen to the media, both around Boston and, and really throughout the country, Schools have common challenges, and I mm. think we've faced most of them here in the last few years, such as you've already mentioned enrollment numbers. Uh, you've already mentioned our, our new schools, so construction mm. and, and fitting grades and all of that. Uh, budget, of course, is a huge one. Mm -hmm. We, like many other systems in greater Boston, have had teacher contract challenges. Mm -hmm. And then more uh, into the schools testing. I think you're in, in MCAST season now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I hear chatter on the street from parents about testing MCAST mm -hmm. in particular. And finally, staff turnover. You've mentioned mm -hmm. sort of some new people coming in, but that also reflects that there has been and probably will continue to be a mm -hmm. lot of staff turnover. That's a lot of things I'm throwing mm -hmm. at you right away. Mm -hmm. uh, Talk a little bit about Gladly. any of them that appeal to you. Gladly. So uh, Belmont is unique because we're able to always get such great student outcomes for a low per pupil cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so the budget has always been a challenge in Belmont, but we've always ended up making it work, mainly because we have families that send us great children every day who are prepared to go to school, uh, and we have great educators. Uh, but now the worries about school and what, mean, what it means for children is more than just the math, it's more than just the, the, uh, the science project, it's actually we have students that have more needs around wraparound services like mental health and, um, and academic supports and uh, in, in the last few years the nurse has played a pivotal role. So budget is gonna look different. Um, and it looks different in Belmont because we were so focused on the high enrollment before COVID right. and now the enrollment has gone down. And the only school that it hasn't gone down is the high school. The high school actually maintained its enrollment through COVID and actually has been going up every year. And the, and the resources that we put in place when enrollment was high was, were at the elementary and middle. So we're actually taking teachers and, re, and reducing teachers at the elementary level in order to try to put those resources where the students are, which are at the high school. So that'll be the, the enrollment working to, to a level now where we 
kind of have a good idea of what it will look like moving forward. It's not going to be that steep incline yeah. anymore. So really what we need to do now, and I give credit to people on the Warren Committee who say, and I think it might have been uh, Ian Helgren, now that we know how many children we're approximately going to have without much up or much down, this is the really good time to settle the budget. Yes. Because now we can actually, you know, say what do we want our schools to look like, what are the services we want our children to have, and how many folks, what kind of services, and when we get that, we're not going to have to change anything dramatically in any future year because the enrollment will stay relatively the same, and we have a really good chance next year to build a budget around what, what do we think a good school looks like in Belmont, and we won't have to worry about adding folks for, for enrollment purposes like we did before. So th those are big things. Staff turnover uh, has been a concern since COVID. We found a lot of teachers, uh, and I respect them a lot, who decided just not to want to do the work anymore because if they couldn't do it in person and with uh, students every day at a very high level without worrying about their own health or their family member's health, then a lot of them decided to, uh, to pursue other careers or retire early. And the next level of concern I have is with building principals. I think mm. that our building principal position is a role that is really caught in the middle. It's kind of like that old-fashioned middle management where they have a lot of pressures coming down around budget and with uh, expectations from the school committee and John Phelan and, and families, but they also have to work with union members and staff and get children what they need. And a lot of those uh, worlds have been kind of cloudy lately. You know, they've been really, uh, people have been asking a lot more questions, they want more information, and so that position I think is gonna be a challenge to fill. Uh, we have two principal ships that we're filling this year. One is at the brand new middle school. Okay, so good. we hired Russ Cooperstein, a Boston public educator, actually has been a principal in Europe in two different oh, wow. countries. He's got a great background. And we're in the final uh, stages of hiring a Winbrook principal that will start next year. And the, um, the next community interview is Wednesday of this yes. week at the Winbrook School, if people want to attend. Yeah, so turnover is, is, a, is an issue. But I, I think that the healthy turnover we have right now is, I think we're at another stage of where Belmont's trajectory is in that I think coming in with a new superintendent to see the building and the configuration plan executed and now can take that organizational structure and move it from a teaching and learning perspective in a budget perspective forward. Right. I think it's a great opportunity for, for a change in leadership. So, and I think Belmont is positioned very well uh, for the next five to 10 years. All right, excellent. You mentioned the nurses, you mentioned uh, mental health, social, emotional mm -hmm. needs of the students. What do you see as some of the changes? You, you know, some of us who have been teachers years and years ago or whose children mm -hmm. had gone through the schools again years and years ago, you know, the focus was on the academics. Mm -hmm. You know, do we have enough AP courses? Who's in the honors course? What, what are we mm -hmm. looking for mm -hmm. going forward? But now with my ear to the ground, I'm hearing a lot more about social, emotional, and, mm -hmm. and other issues. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So what, what we were doing before COVID hit through our uh, social emotional learning work was asking kids how they felt about school, asking teachers how they felt about school, and asking families how they felt about school. Uh, and what we found out back in 2017, 18, and 19 was that some families didn't feel welcome, some students didn't feel safe or heard or seen. And when we correlated who those students were with their academic outcomes, it was really clear that they were connected. Okay. So our students of color, our students who may be LBGTQ, our students who were just, you know, uh, from a large family that maybe was socioeconomically not as advantaged as someone else, they, 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 had, they, just, they weren't feeling valued in school or seen or weren't doing well. So when we connected their student outcomes with what they were telling us, that's when we started to put together some supports for them. And those supports could look like uh, working groups in every school to talk about how kids felt what they needed. Uh, maybe some support groups for folks to talk with our students who are black and brown. We have black and brown in Belmont. We have SEL teams. Uh, we have equity teams in every building. Um, in all those groups of adults getting together to support students was in service of their learning. So because we're a school. So our main agenda and our main focus is the high level of engagement and student outcomes for kids academically. Mm -hmm. But to get there underneath that, we really need to make students feel safe, heard, and valued in school so they can actually take part in the work of learning every day. And if you go into school and you don't feel safe, you're not gonna learn. Right. So if we can kind of balance that out, uh, show value for everybody, show that we appreciate that they're there, that they uh, contribute to our community, that we want them to be part of our school, want everyone to be part of our school and successful, 
everybody needs a little bit kind of different support, but if we can give a little bit of those things to everybody, we have such a high amount of students who do well every year, you know, where oh, yeah. the amount of AP courses that we met with, um, we were the fourth in the state in MCAS tests taken and a okay. test score higher than three. Yeah. And we were the smallest school district to be in that list. Wow. So what I want is I want all those students to continue to thrive. And I want that, that next level of students who think they can get there to help them get there. I would like them to jump over that hurdle and jump into that pool of students who are accessing high uh, level courses, who are accessing opportunities. Uh, so that's the work going forward. And those types of positions, those wraparound positions, mm. math coach, social worker, nurse, uh, reading intervention specialist, they help all that and then they lift everybody up. So that's the goal. Excellent. So as we're coming out of COVID, Mm -hmm. um, and you're talking about uh, achievement levels and, and measuring outcomes. What do you see in testing trends? Are the scores starting to level off or go up? Mm -hmm. Or um, you're in MCAS season now. Yeah. How's all that working out? So the, the, M course, the MCAS scores across the state are lower than they were mm -hmm. for everybody. And within that new kind of balance sheet of scores, we're still at the top of those scores. So the good news is Belmont continues to outpace the state and in our academic outcomes. Good. But for, for our families, there's still a little bit of a, uh, a concern that they're down a notch. And so we have hired, uh, we do uh, more testing for students to know exactly where they are in their reading and their math. We bought a new universal screener, which every child has to take a quick assessment so we can see exactly where they are. So if they, we want to change up any of the group work, we can okay. engage them differently. So high flyers go together and do some high flyer work. Students in the middle get a little bit of that. Students who need some support, we have small group work that we're doing. So yeah. those types of things, and we're, we're actually organizing our curriculum differently, and then we're taking a look at it so we can make sure that the K-12 to articulation kind of connect and meet in a certain way. So all those things will, will actually work themselves out for the kids moving forward, but we do have to focus on the students that are in front of us right now, right. And, and some of them have gaps that we need to address, and uh, we've been able to use federal funds to address some of those gaps. All right. Um, you've mentioned a lot of features of the Belmont system, mm -hmm. students, parents, teachers, whatever. Of all of that mix, what do you see as maybe the standout strength of the Belmont Public Schools? I, I say it all the time, the standout strengths are the, the students we receive and the teachers who work with them every day. The, the, what goes on in the classrooms, the educators are just dedicated, professional, uh, hardworking, uh, always learning, you know, the professional development that they receive and the work they receive with the directors and Janice Darius, our assistant superintendent, they, they really build nice, at the elementary school, small learning environments so kids can get everything they need. Uh, I think that when we go to a four, five, six school and we keep that school young with grades four, five, right. and six, and the seven through 12, I think the new configuration will really be a great vehicle to support environments where learning can happen. Uh, so I, I, think it's, I think it's the students and the teachers it, it really is families, the, the families people. and the staff all yeah. the time. It's always the people. It is the know? people. We, we put a lot of emphasis on these buildings, Yeah, but it, it is the people. It is, and, when you, and, and making the people happy, like you walk into the new 7 through 12 middle high school, the natural light, the colors, the, the availability to look into rooms and see learning happening, create an environment where the people then can feel happy, excited about being in work. And, and so the environment adds to it, but it is the people in the end. Okay. No, you're right. Hmm. Um, okay, now with all of that as the table setting, is there anything you wished that you might have had more time to accomplish, or is there something else you wished you had maybe tackled and hmm. just never got to it? Sure, I, I think that um, the next big phase we have in Belmont will be to ensure that we have a budget that actually creates the supports and the programming for our special education population of students. We didn't have any room anywhere in the district in 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So trying to add programming for students who may have already needed to go out of district to get their education, which they deserved, and be able to keep them in a, in a classroom in Belmont uh, was really not an option for a period of time. So now that we're opening up the 7 through 12 school fully, we have a brand new lab wing that will have totally dedicated to special education. Good. Our lab programming at the middle school has now more room to grow, so they're growing programs because we're losing the seventh and eighth grade. Uh, we're working with the lab board to talk about the types of program we can do at the other schools when the elementaries get more space. So I think having more of our children go to school in our schools 
and get the services that they want to have and be part of the school community is something that I look forward to seeing happen in Belmont now that the infrastructure is in place. Um, and that, that would be one of the most important things. And, and, and getting back to just the, uh, the teaching and learning where students are happy every day and staff are happy to be in school. I mean, yeah. if, if you, you know, you, school should be a fun place to be. Absolutely. In, in most of our schools it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're right, because again, I, I hear that, that the parents, everybody wants kids to go to school in their own town. Mm -hmm. And so the more we yeah. can bring those programs back, and you're right, you will free up a lot of space at the middle school when mm -hmm. you change, at the Chenery, when you change yeah. the configuration. Um, I will tell you, on, I was on that building committee, and the lab program was never envisioned when we were right. putting that school together. Yeah. And all of a sudden, as we approached the end, it was, oh, hey, can you give us X number of classrooms? And right. it was a squeeze. Yeah. We were happy to do it. It worked out beautifully. I think the placement of those classrooms mm. was great, but it was tight for the first few years. Yeah. And, and I think the, the lab is the uh, special education collaborative that we belong to that is the highest functioning uh, collaborative in the, in the state. So They're we're so lucky successful. to be part oh, of it. Yeah. And anytime we can actually partner with them to expand services and we're welcoming Watertown into the lab collaborative next year. They have a high school vocational program so our students will be able to access vocational special education services, which is really awesome. And um, the Arlington School will be done a year after ours, so they'll create some space. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of upside to create programming uh, for all of our students in Belmont. And, and have a majority chance of having that, that program be offered in Belmont would be, would be awesome. All right. Um, what piece of advice would you give to Dr. Geyser as she comes in? So Dr. Geyser and I have already met a few times. Oh, we, have a, we meet every two weeks, and uh, we have three days uh, in the district that we plan on hosting her. Okay, and good. she'll be at several events with the school committee chair, Meg Moriarty, over the next two weeks. Uh, and we're really organizing our work around budget, around how we work with our educators union, how we work around the, the configuration change. And we're actually moving a whole lot of staff this summer. Um, so, you know, my advice, and, and she knows how to do this because she's an assistant superintendent in a, in, a, in a great community right now, that, you know, listening uh, to the people about what works, what they want to keep in Belmont, what they treasure about the town, in the school system I think is really important. And then ask the next question, is there anything that you'd like to see that hasn't been tried yet or mm -hmm. you'd like to take a look at? And, and taking a chance on some of those things and building your plan out from there. But uh, we've already, I've created a list and your name is on that list of uh -oh. people to talk to in the town <laughs> to get background about all the things that have happened and all the things that need to continue. Um, meeting you know, select board members, members of the capital committee, members like yourself and Pat and Bill. and. Um, and then drawing her own conclusions about you know how she wants to lead the district. And as a resident, uh, I think she already understands a lot of the things that are going on in the schools that are working and that need awesome. to move forward. And uh, and she'll be great. She's going to be really dedicated to the work. All right. We've we've mentioned now multiple times budget, and we haven't kind of zeroed in on mm -hmm. it. Um, what's what's sort of a capsule overview of budget? We we haven't mm -hmm. hit the June town meeting yet, mm -hmm. so. We haven't had the opportunity for the full discussion, mm -hmm. at least at town meeting. Um, budget is tough. We don't have the money. We're, we're drawing on mm -hmm. a lot of free cash. Yeah. What do you see going forward? So I see the need for an override. Um, it's very clear that when you want to determine what do you think the size of the override should be, you just have to point to the number of dollars that are one-time dollars. Right. That it's a simple equation, now, right? right? So if you're using $9 million to support your $128 million budget or $129 million budget, you need an override of about $9 million <laughs> because you're using those dollars that aren't coming back and, the, and they've, they're, they're no one longer. Time funds. So I think that um, the, the town actually, even though we had to reduce some staff in order to open the new school and keep everything whole, the schools have received a tremendous amount of one-time money and we're very thankful for that. Uh, from Mike Widmer all the way down to the Warren Committee and the Select Board and the School Committee. Um, and I think there might be some conversation about whether we can ask for more town meeting or not. I, I've always subscribed to the year-long work that we do together right. to come right. to agreements and come to assumptions that we're all working towards, that once we walk in that we, we've all agreed that we're going to try to make the best of what this we have and we try to move it forward. And, uh, and that's, that has been controversial for me sometimes because sometimes that is looked at as not advocating for the more in the school budget, but we're, we're all working on relationships together in the town in order to do what's best for the entire town and the schools. Right. And my job is to over-advocate for the schools a little bit, but with respect to the context of where we are. So I think if we do that together as a group, this town meeting, 
hopefully that will be the foundation of a working group that can get together to talk about what an override could look like, why we need it, what could we use, what does a good school budget look like, right. what right. does a good DPW budget look like, they need, you know, what does a good well, police right. budget all, all look like. All the other departments yeah. are hurting just as well. So we, we need to have that honest conversation about uh, what each department needs and, and the town will make a decision of whether they want to service it at a, a good level, an okay level, or a not okay level. And that's going to be the number that the district or the town chooses to ask for an override and whether they voted or not. Right. Uh, but there's great advocates in the town that will work hard. Um, so I, lo I look forward to the town being successful next year, and I think they will. We'll just we'll keep our fingers crossed, and yeah. we'll, see, we'll see what happens. And, we'll and see what unfolds. And, and the hope is we've always talked about in our Warren Committee meetings and our Financial Task Force 1 and Financial Task Force 2 is that I think the learning here is that some of the towns that have been successful in having financial planning have had smaller, more frequent overrides. Yes, yes. And one of my suggestions would be, in, in, uh, and I was in a town that did do that in the late 90s and early 2000s, was to have a $3 million override maybe every two or three years yes. just to add that infusion because the costs are going up by more than 2.5%. Uh, just when you roll over salary for the, the town and the schools, it's 4%. So you're already 1.5% short. Right. And you can only make that up with a little free cash or a little bit of money that the schools or the DPW gives back every year. Right. And you can't depend on that as, as, as income or revenue. No, uh, and the not state, at all. the state has a, a, a large amount of revenue from all the federal dollars that they got. But we only got a 1.6% increase last year in FY23. We've got a better, we're looking to get a better increase this year. Um, so we're hoping that the state can continue to be a partner uh, but I think we, the town has to make a decision about how they infuse more revenue into the, into the budget picture for sure. Right, and as you say, a longer term plan that's yes. not sort of staggering from one crisis to the you, next. You just can't, can't and, 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 and it's too important uh, in the infrastructure in Belmont is so strong with the, with the capital assets that we have and will have that this is just the last piece. I think a financial plan uh, that some people will really like, some people may or may not like, may not. but it, it, it costs money to run a town. Uh, it's a lot of money for a small town. It's $129 million, yeah. uh, over the course of just 24, 26,000 uh, houses, families, people, taxpayers. Fewer than yeah. 10,000 taxable households, yeah. yes. So it, it's a big ask, and, um, and my community is the same size, and we're looking for an override in my town this year too. So Belmont's not, certainly not alone, and it's a challenge to make ends meet in, in this kind of state environment where a lot of state and federal dollars go to, quote, quote more needier districts. Uh, right. Belmont is in that suburban triangle of doing well but not financially as well as we'd like to, and we're caught up in that. So uh, but Belmont will work its way through it. The volunteers of the town like yourself, they need a whole other generation of people like you and Pat and Bill. We've got to and, cultivate, yeah, yes, we've got younger to cultivate, people, yeah. absolutely. We're getting a little tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that in mind, what are your future plans? What do you hope to be doing going forward? So I, I will uh, take my time. I'm leaving at the end of August, so I have a little time to figure it out. Good. I would like to do some work that is either uh, supporting uh, students or families or uh, maybe nonprofit work that supports uh, folks who may not have enough uh, or, or a seat at the table. I think I'd like to represent that, that group of people moving forward. So we'll see. Uh, meeting people out there, networking a little bit. but. Uh, I'm lucky to be able to watch my children. I have five children at home that uh, will be glad to see me with a little more balance uh, in uh, my work no and family nights. life. So uh, yeah, so yeah, no, no rush, it'll all work out. Excellent, okay. Um, let's wrap it up with uh, fondest or happiest memory of being in Belmont. So a lot of happy memories. Uh, they would be around uh, meeting with people like you at the Winbrook in the teacher's room and trying to figure out hard problems and having so many people just come with ideas, ask hard questions, have hard conversations and leave meetings with, with real like plans that were workable and, and we advocated for things that now we're seeing the, the fruits of our labor coming up with, you know, lot, lots of times in education you don't really see the fruits of your labor because it's a human being who grows over time and then leaves. And if you're an elementary teacher, you don't see that senior uh, and if you're a superintendent, you're not connected to the students as much. So in my previous roles, I would live in the community and work in the community. So I'd see the kids. So my, my biggest gift was watching them grow into good you know, adults and human beings. 
Uh, but in Belmont, because my work was more adult driven, I think that I, I take a lot of pride in some of the capital things that have happened through your hard work and the hard work of the building committee and happy to have a structure in place that the town can lean on for a long time to, uh, to support the kids of Belmont. Okay. Well, John, thank you. This has been a wide ranging and interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your nine years in Belmont. As you said, I can't believe it's been nine years. It's gone <laughs> by so quickly, but a lot has happened. And thank you so much for your hard work and your involvement and your reaching out and involving people like me and others. I think we all appreciate well, that. I, I appreciated all the volunteer work of the folks at Belmont. I, I said to everybody in the community, uh, get out, support the Warren Committee, support the building program, support the library, the rink. It all comes back to you. Uh, support the Foundation for Belmont Education, Education too. Education as well. They're yes. awesome, yeah. Yes. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Anne-Marie Mahoney for Belmont Journal. Thank you so much for joining us, and see you the next time.